All right, so let's come back to this question, uh, wave equation on a disk. Uh, but let me, I mean, I, I already solved a, a portion of it before, but uh, uh, over there I had the radius as 1, but I changed my mind. I want this to be radius L, right? So I can use the general vessel function, uh, Fourier vessel series. Okay, so you have this, and there's a, an extra condition that I didn't write, which was that uh, in the in the radial direction, in polar coordinates, the angle theta goes from either from 0 to 2 pi, but we're going to use the convention that starts from negative pi to positive pi. And uh, it, it has to be periodic, right? So you want the function in the theta direction to be periodic. So the value of u when theta is pi, should you agree with the value of u at when theta is negative pi, and also their derivatives should agree in the theta direction. So that's extra condition that I didn't write. Uh, and also there are some, some bounds here that I'm not writing. Uh, but here, this is the wave equations. So uh, utt equals the c squared times the Laplacian of u. That's the generic wave equation, and uh, the right side is now written in polar coordinates. So this is the Laplace equation written in, uh, in terms of polar coordinate system. Uh, now this one says for any value of theta and any value of time, the uh, value of u, which is the, the wider, the, the up and down displacement of a drum head. That's what I'm picturing when I write this. Uh, at the edge, when when r is equal to l, that's like the edge of the drum, and we we fix it, right? We we fix it so that that part doesn't change. Only the drum head is vibrating, and, and we want to uh, solve that. So this is the boundary condition of on the disk. Whereas these two conditions are what happens when time t is zero. So this one is the initial configuration of the, the drum head, and this is the initial velocity of the drum head. So uh, you can kind of imagine that you're a drummer and you're, you're punching this drum head with the drumstick, right? And the moment it, it touches the drum head and you release it, there are two things happening. Uh, because you hit it, uh, the, there's a slight dent in the drum, drum, set, uh, the drum head a little bit going in, right? Also, uh, even if you release it, you, you push this somehow, so there's some initial velocity, right? So we're going to assume that there's some complicated initial configuration uh, and the initial velocity at every point of the drum head. Okay? Every point of the drum head can be described by r comma theta using polar coordinate system, right? Okay, so we're trying to solve this, and uh, although I already did part one before. Let me just redo this, but uh, this time I'll be a bit more quick because uh, I want to get to the part where we have the uh, Bessel function equation, right? Okay, so let's try this uh, uh, solution. So we start out by, actually because I need more room, I'm, I'm even going to delete this one. And let me write the solutions right here. Uh, we start out by writing down the separation of variables, uh, u as a function of t for time, and function of r, a radial function, times a function of theta. And we are trying to find the building blocks of the solution that satisfies this with this boundary condition and, and a, a little bit more that I'm not ready. Uh, Okay, so we plug it into the left side and the right side. Let's see what happens. If I plug this on the left side, it's t double prime r theta equal to c squared uh, t r double prime theta plus 1 over r t r prime theta plus 1 over r squared uh, t r theta double prime. Uh, okay, so that's what we have. 
and then we divide both sides by tr theta with the c squared. The, the c squared is like the k, the coefficient. Uh, so you, in the heat equation, we divide by kxt, right? So the same thing here, we divide by c squared xt. So if I divide by c squared xt, no, c squared tr theta, I get t double, well, let's just divide everything by c squared tr theta here. So c, c squared tr theta. Then r theta, r theta cancels, so you get t double prime over c squared of t equals to, on the right side, c squared cancel away, and tr double prime theta over tr theta will give you r double prime over r. And then the next one will be 1 over r, uh, r prime over r. And then this over there, this over this will have trs canceling, and you get 1 over r squared uh, theta double prime over theta equals to 0. Uh, r squared. Okay. Oh, not equal to 0, sorry. Keep saying 0. Not 0. It, it's, this is the equal sign. All right, so this is what I get once I plug in the separated, very, uh, in, plug in u into the separated form, and then I divide every side by tr theta, and then the immediate consequence is that the left side is a function of t only, whereas the right side is a function of r and theta. And uh, I had some explanation why this side cannot be a negative value. So uh, I talked about uh, this side equals to a number giving you something called the Hel Helmholtz equation, uh, Helmholtz eigenvalue problem. And uh, uh, last time I explained a whole lot of things why that can't be uh, negative. Uh, no, that, that has to be negative? Yeah, that has to be negative, right? So, uh, it's negative mu squared, right? Yeah, negative mu squared. Uh, the, hopefully this is not confusing, but I decided to put lambda for this one because uh, a lot of the other literature use lambda. So let me, let me write down negative lambda squared. And I'm going to use mu for the other one. Is okay. that okay? All right, yeah. Okay, so that's uh, what we have. And then uh, that means I have two set of equations. This equals to negative lambda squared, in which case if I multiply this to the other side and bring it to this side as t double prime plus c squared lambda squared t equals to 0. And this other one would be r double prime plus 1 over r, r prime, oh no, no, I still want r in the denominator. Okay, and then uh, plus 1 over r squared theta prime over theta equals to negative lambda squared. And what I want to do now is uh, I first want to multiply by the small r squared and bring this one over here, whereas this one goes to the other side. So here's what I get, r double prime over r plus, no, no. First, multiply everything by r squared. So I, I have r squared multiplied here. r is multiplied here. And then this one's also multiplied by r squared, but we brought it this side, so it's plus lambda squared, uh, small r squared, equals to negative theta prime over theta. Okay. Yes? This is that theta double prime. Theta, theta double prime, thank you. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. You know, it's so complicated, just one mistake will make the ent entire thing after, after it all like, crumble into pieces. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, anytime you see a mistake, make sure you, you pay attention and fix it, okay? All right, so I'm going to say this is equal to mu because then this, this side here turns into theta double prime plus mu theta 
equals to zero. Right? If you multiply theta to the other side and add the negative theta dou prime to the other side, then you get this as the equation. And then there's the uh, periodic conditions that we talked about, that uh, theta of pi has to agree with theta of pi, negative pi, and theta prime of pi has to agree with theta prime of negative pi. So there was, there was that condition that I talked about which translates to this. Uh, and we did something similar in Laplace equation over a disk, so I don't want to go into further details in this. So this is what we have. Do you remember what are the solutions of these? Is it R setup? Hmm? N squared. N setup? Like the, mu, the mu N, N squared is N squared. Yes, S yes, squared exactly. So yeah, yeah. Mu and then. Right, yeah. that's exactly right. So uh, the, the mu is our eigenvalue, and uh, we know that the only time you have a non-trivial solution satisfying all of these are when mu is equal to some n squared, some integer squared, right? And uh, you have theta equal to, uh, yeah, cosine n theta, so let's put c1 here, plus c2 sine n theta. That's what we get, which forces this mu to equal to n squared. That mu has to equal to n squared if we want a non-trivial solution. All right, so let's continue on. Okay, I want to save some equations. So. This, this is another one that we will have to solve later, so let me put that there. This one we need. Uh, but now, we have to figure out what, what this means. Okay. So, now we have this equation equals to n squared. So if I multiply by r, and bring the r to the left side, here's what I get. I get r squared r double prime plus r r prime plus lambda squared uh, r squared minus n, n squared and then uh, r. r equals to zero. Okay, and uh, then, I mean, we, we did all this before, um, we're just reviewing this. Uh, we, we had to do an extra change of variables here. Do you remember what it was? It was that x equals to lambda r. Okay. So if you do that and, and change all this, it just becomes x squared r double prime. Or just to make it even look simpler, let's use y double prime. So let's say y is r. Okay. Then you get this. You get this equation, and uh, what is this thing called again? Bessel function. This is the Bessel's equation, right? So the Bessel's equation has solutions that look like C1 Jn x plus C2 Jn uh, Yn x uh, with with uh, uh, with one of them being a problem child because uh, this has, this goes to infinity or negative infinity at zero, right? Yeah. Actually, it goes to negative infinity at zero. So, uh, if you're trying to solve for a drum head, then uh, this this would be non-physical. However, I mean, if you if you have a weird case where you have a drum head that looks like a, it has an empty hole in the middle, and then you have some fixed here, something fixed here, and then you you're punching that, then that would have both of these. So, what was that? If you have a drum where, usually drum is like you have a frame that's circular and then you have a you know, animal skin on it, right? Um, but let's say you have a frame here and frame here, and then 
only had the skin here, right? And if you punch it with a drum drumstick, then uh, in that case, it's okay to have negative infinity, but that because that part doesn't exist. In that case, both of them would be used, right? But for our case, when interior is filled, then this one doesn't make sense, and you only have this one. Okay. All right. So what that tells us is that what that tells us is that since uh, x is equal to lambda r, the solution for capital R as a function of r would be some constant times j and uh, lambda x like that. Okay, but not lambda x, lambda r. X is lambda r. So instead of x, we replace by lambda r. Okay. Now, uh, you know the difference between countable and uncountable? Some, some of the yeah. engineering students wouldn't know what that means. Natural numbers are countable, right? You can you can number them, right? But real numbers are not. There's no way to count them, number them in a way that you can you can number every real number. That's some weird thing. Uh, if you want to write something as a series, your your functions that you get better be countable. So uh, one thing that you should immediately alarm you is that. Uh, this should this seems to be true for any lambda, right? Well, n, n is good. N is an integer. That's what we have, right? But lambda seems to be any real number, which means we have uncountably many solutions for R. That's no good, right? So we must be missing something here. Uh, so what are we missing? We're missing this one, this this boundary condition. So what does this boundary condition say? It says R, you, you plug in L into R, and then actually T of T times R of R, but L is being plugged into R, and theta of theta has to equal to zero. That's what it means to be fixed at on the frame, right? Uh, but then, if you let any of these two become zero, that makes u a trivial solution, so that can't be. So what you end up with is that r of l must be zero. Okay. Now let's see what that means. That means that when you plug in l both sides, you could better have zero equals to some constant jn. Uh, lambda times L. Now in here, uh, we don't want C to be, well, let's not even think about the constant multiple. We just need to find one non-trivial. Okay. If you have many different things that are multiple of each other, you just have to find one non-trivial solution. Okay. So we, we need this to equal to zero, which means lambda L has to be a zero of the Bessel function of order n, right? Uh, but unfortunately, the Bessel function of order n, the zeros of Bessel functions of order n, it's, we don't know exactly where they are, right? Uh, we can only have approximate values. Uh, we do know that in infinity, they are about evenly spaced. Because, as I said, the intuition about Bessel function is like, it's like a sinusoidal curve, but the amplitude is decreasing like 1 over square root of r, right? Uh, so, it, 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 indeed, it does, it does do that eventually, but in the beginning, uh, it's not that regular. So, uh, especially because, you know, uh, Bessel function of high order, Will, will increase very 
gradually, right? You've seen the graph, right? A Bessel function, function of order 3 would be like almost zero and then eventually increase to something. So when it falls back to zero again, it takes quite a while to get your first zero. So uh, because of that, we don't have a, a nice way of writing this. The only thing we could do is to say that this should be j and k, where j and k is the k zero, k positive zero of of j n x. Okay, so if we use that j n k uh, thingy, then then we have this identity, so that we have the lambda as j n k divided by capital L. And that's nice because now. Uh, it means that you can't have any arbitrary real number. It has to be these discrete values. Right? So now you, even if there's separate n and these things, these are countable. Right? So you can write them as double sum. So that's, that's, that's good, right? OK. So we have that. And, and plugging that back in, we have that, that the r of r is equal to Jn and k over Lx. All right, so uh, we got the theta, we got the r. Now what remains is just this one. Right? Now this one, you solve this by Writing the characteristic equation, uh, R, I don't want to use R. Uh, so, so if you say T is the ansatz is e to the uh, a t, right? So that's our ansatz. Right? Ansatz meaning you you have some idea of what the solution should look like, right? And we know that uh, if you have a second order differential equation with constant coefficients, then all the solutions look like e to something times t, right? So you plug that in here, and then the equation you get for a would be, normally I use r for this, but that's when, <laughs> but, but we already have r for something else, that's why I'm, I'm hesitating here. You get a squared, because if you differentiate this twice, you get a squared plus uh, c squared lambda squared, and that has to equal to 0. So the value of a is a is uh, plus minus uh, square root of c squared lambda squared, and then you have a square root of negative 1, which is i, right? So plus minus c lambda i. So that means your solutions look like uh, C lambda i t, and you have one for this one, and then another one for negative C lambda i t. But then uh, we don't like using that because that produces complex values, right? And it, it, we're trying to solve a real value problem, so we don't like that. So. We have to convert this using the Euler identity as sines and cosines. And uh, this is like cosine of C lambda t plus I times sine of C lambda t. And this one is with the, uh, uh, the con complex conjugate one. So the, the conclusion is that the solution of such a thing is T of t equals to some constant times cosine c lambda t plus c2 times sine c lambda t. And we also have the value of lambda. Lambda is, lambda is this, right? Okay. So those are the functions t of t. Okay, so 
So we found the general formula? Now we found the general formula, okay? So we found all the building blocks, okay? Uh, so here's how you can think about it. Uh, there's like two choices for T of T. It could be cosine or sine. And two choices for theta it could be cosine or sine. And there's one choice for R, which is this one. So uh, you can choose cosine jn and cosine, or you can choose cosine jn and sine, or you can use cosine and sine. No, no, sine and jn and cosine and sine and jn and sine. Okay. So there are four types that look like this. Okay. And those are all the possible solutions. Oh, there's something that I forgot to say. C1, uh, C2. Yeah, yeah, so so the thing is, if you multiply them, you get like, if you have this one times that, then you get like C1 with twiddle with C1, and it's just too much. So I just want to, I don't want to write it like that. I just want to uh, think of these as individual building blocks and then just put them together in a single multiplication, and then you get a gigantic sum. Okay, so. Uh, all this work that we've done so far has given us the following general solution. The general solution we have would be that u of r times theta r theta t should look like and it's a double sum because uh, there's the k and there's the n, right? And uh, something that I forgot to write, I usually take one point off for any time people forgetting this, but I actually forgot it myself, so shame on me. Uh, this n starts from zero. And that's because even when n is zero, you get cosine of zero, which is one, right? You get the constant function, and you can see that I, I deleted the, the formula for theta, but if you can see that the equation for theta is still satisfied by a constant. So uh, this actually starts from zero. So n can start from zero. Whereas k is, you're counting from one, right? You, like there's no zero positive zero. Uh, you start from one. So first positive zero, second positive zero, and third. So k starts from one. So what it means is that uh, it's a double sum with uh, summation n goes from 0 to infinity and k goes from 1 through infinity. Okay. And then you have, uh, I'll call this a n, and uh, that's the one with the cosine. Okay, so a n. Uh, J n J n k over L x not x sorry r why did I put x there somebody should have pointed it out right, so you have that and then uh, I have to choose I, I want it to be in the order of r theta t okay so theta would be be cosine okay, so cosine n theta and then uh, t, I want to choose the cosine, so it's cosine c times j and k over l t, because that's your lambda, right? We, we have the lambda as this one. Right? So that's one. That's one term. We are going to call this coefficient as a n. Plus, now b n would be the one with The sine one, sine and theta, cosine c j and k over l t plus c n. Now c n would now be the one where the, the uh, time function is the sine one. So j n, j and k over l r uh, sine. Now, cosine of and theta, but sine of c, j, and k over l time plus uh, dn, uh, 
have Jn, Jnk over Lr uh, sine and theta sine c times c times j and k over lt. Okay, so you end up with this huge series with a double sum. It's a double sum with four terms inside the summation with coefficients a n, b n, c n, and d n. Right? Okay. Now, what does this satisfy? Well, this satisfies the original wave equation with this condition, the uh, boundary of the drum being fixed to zero, as well as the periodicity in the theta direction that I didn't write over here, that's true. Uh, but a n, b n, c n, and d n are yet to be determined, and they depend on which one, do you remember? What should determine a n and b n? Is it even a function? No. It was something that I raised, the conditions that I raised. The initial conditions. The initial conditions, uh, f and g, right? So the initial conditions were that u r theta 0 was f r theta and u t r theta 0 was given as g r theta. All right, so now let's try to see uh, how to get that. Well, first of all, let's plug in, so, so uh, I just want to give you a formula for a n and b n and the, the formula for CN and DN is your homework. Okay, so in your homework set, you'll see that there's a homework to figure out what CN and DN. Uh, so let's plug in theta, uh, no, t equals to zero to this, this crazy formula here, but uh, if you look at what u r theta zero is, well, we're plugging in zero into t, right? So if I plug in zero here, what does this become? One. One. How about this one? One. one. How about this one? Zero. Zero. How about this one? Zero. So two terms, the, the ones with CN and DN disappear. Uh, you only have AN and BN. Right? So you see that AN and BNs are determined by F, and later on you'll see that uh, CN and DN will be determined by G. Okay? So the formula for getting CN and DN would need the, the G, and the formula for AN and BN you'll need the F. Okay? So let's plug in zero for that, so n equals to zero through infinity, k from one through infinity, that's a n, j n, uh, j and k over l, r, okay, uh, cosine and theta, right, plus b n, j n, j n k over l r sine and theta. Okay, so that's what we have, and that has to equal to that has to equal to this. Okay. So, in order to get a n and b n, I better know uh, how to express f r theta as this one. And if you look at this. It's actually, uh, oh, oh, sorry, there's, there's another thing I forgot. This is not a n, but it's a n k. b n k, c n k, d n k, right? Because it, it, it depends on n and k, right? So it's not the same value for all, all uh, k. It's different for each k as well. It's, so this, this constant should be different for each n and k, so that's why you need to write a and k. So this should be a and k, b and k. And first of all, in order to make this look more like what we are used to, let's rewrite this as summation n equals to 0 through infinity of, uh, what is it? Uh, can we get the j and k over l? Outside 
that I want I want to move this outside because these these don't depend on k, right? And I can bring them outside. So what what's happening is it's going to look like summation of k equals to one through infinity of a and k, j n, j and k over l r. This thing times cosine n theta plus summation of k equals to 1 through infinity, b n k, j n, j n k over l r. This thing times sine n theta. Okay. So uh, what you want to do is you want to express this f r theta as this, but for a moment, forget that it's a function of r. Just fix the value of r. Okay? If you fix the value of r and you call this part right here as capital A n and this one as capital B n, what do you have? Yeah, that's what you have, the free of cosine and sine series. Okay, so we have the following. Not the free of cosine and sine series, it's a full Fourier series. Because you're, ex you're expressing a function of theta as sum of both sine and cosine. So that's the full Fourier series. Uh, so what you get is that the, the sigma of k goes to 1 through infinity of a and k, j and, j and k over lr, would equal to the formula for finding a n. What was that? It's like uh, 1 over l integral from 0 to l of fr theta. Uh, Wait, no, it's not from zero to L. It's a th theta component, but, but you see, theta, it goes from negative pi to pi, right? So it, it's, uh, you, you divide it by one over two pi, and you integrate from negative pi to pi of f r theta times so cosine n theta d theta. Okay. So this, this quantity, which we're, 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 for the moment, we're just going to fix the r value and think of both sides as functions of theta. No, not functions of theta. Oh, so, so we, we're thinking of this as coefficient a n, and uh, we think of this f as a function of theta, so if you just plug into the usual free sine series and cosine series, that's what we get. But now let's look at what this is. What is this? This is uh, uh, because you've integrated away the theta, now it's a function of r. r. So this you can think of like a function of r. And look what we, ha what we have. f r with the, uh, each fixed value of n, right? I'm trying to make this equal to this. What is this left side called? Fourier Bessel series, right? It's a Fourier Bessel series, and we just found the, the formula for the uh, finding a and k, right? So what was, what was the uh, formula for a and k? We just had a k, but now we have to put n as well. So a and k is equal to, you integrate from 0 to L of this function, which is this entire thing, 1 over 2 pi, negative pi to pi, of f r theta cosine n theta d theta. They share the same n for each n, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so right now we're fixing r and n. Oh, okay. So, so when we when we look when we write this formula, we're also fixing n. Okay. Right. But um, the left side we have k from one to infinity, but right side don't have. You don't, because you're, this is a function of r, and we're expressing it as a series. Oh, okay. A series must have an index, right? Okay. Yeah. 
So this times, this is our function, times Jn, uh, J and K over L R dr, right, divided by one half L squared Jn plus one of uh, J and K squared. Okay? So that's the formula for getting a and k. Now in the homework, I think I put the d theta outside, but it doesn't matter which order you do. Okay? So if you do the free Bessel first and then do the other one, uh, or, or because these are both numbers, you can just switch the order of integration without having to think about the domain. Okay? So uh, I think in the homework, I have this outside and this inside. Okay? And put the d theta outside and dr. Yeah, because this doesn't have a theta, you can bring it inside the d theta. So uh, may maybe I should rewrite this again. So, sorry. Formula for a n is now. Uh, what is this? This is uh, one over two pi integral from negative pi to pi integral from zero to l fr theta times jn jnk over l r and then cosine n theta and then you have dr d theta divided by one half l squared jn plus one j and k squared. Okay. So that's your a and k. Uh, now, this, this actually needs a separate formula for a zero k, right? For a zero k, it requires yet another formula because uh, the free series one has, has a different formula for a zero k, right? So that one I'm also not going to write because <laughs> it's too much. Right. And then, uh, if you do the same thing for b and k, the only difference is now you just need to change the cosine to sine. So b and k would now equal to 1 over 2 pi, negative pi to pi, 0 to L, fr theta, jn, j and k over lr, and then uh, sine n theta dr d theta divided by 1 half L squared jn plus 1 uh, jn k. Okay? So uh, that's how you get the, the a and k and b and k, and you should try to do the other one. Right? Okay. But. Uh, what use are these formulas? Well, first of all, you, you see that already, in most cases, this integral has to be done numerically. Right? You know how to do integrals numerically, right? Riemann sums? So, uh, you, you will first have to, to integrate by theta, and usually if, uh, it's not, if it's not complicated in terms of theta, you can multiply by cosine theta of cosine and theta or sine and theta and, and integrate, that part is e easier. Easier, not, not easy. Uh, so let's say you did that part and then now when it comes to doing the uh, R case, uh, usually you're stuck with uh, having to do the integral uh, numerically. Okay? So you have that. So Although we wrote down the formula, it still requires some numerical integration if you actually want to see the solutions. Uh, another thing I want you to know is that uh, what all this means is that u eventually is the sum of things that look like jn, j, so let me just now erase everything and restart the discussion. Okay. 
So what this is saying is that u r theta t is like sum of sum of these things, something that has a Bessel function in the radial direction. And in the, not the radial, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, radial direction you have the Bessel function. In the angular direction you have sine or cosine. I'll just put, I'll just put cosine. Okay. And then uh, in the time direction you ha also have cosine. And what, what it means is that uh, this is saying that the higher number you have, uh, let me see. Let's see. Right, right, right. So this, this actually depends on n and k, right? So the, the higher the number n and k becomes, this value becomes higher, right? And th this part is called the angular frequency, right? Angular. So uh, I think you divide this by two pi, and you you actually get the frequency. So the bigger number this is, the the faster it will vibrate. Okay. So what you have is that uh, if you hit a drum, the moment you hit a drum, it's it it gives you vibrations that are superpositions of all these. Uh, I said the physics word, uh, mathematicians say linear combination. Yeah. Uh, physicists like to say superposition, meaning this, it's, 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 you, you multiply something and you add these. Okay? So it, it's a superposition of all these different frequencies, giving you different frequencies of sound at the same time. And that's what you hear, you're hearing. When you hit a drum, that's what's happening. Right? Uh, and the higher the n and k's are, the higher the frequency is. And usually, for this series to converge, if you have some smooth f of r theta and g of r theta, then the, the coefficient dk, decays quite rapidly. So uh, you don't hear a lot of high frequencies. So you get the, the most basic one, which is uh, j01. That value is going to create some very low frequency. That's called the fundamental frequency. So, uh, does anyone play drums here? Okay, no, no, it's not fun. So, if you play drums, uh, there are like two kinds. There's a snare, which is which gives you like a very noisy kind of drum, which doesn't have a lot of frequency. It has usually you put something on it to 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 make complex sounds on it. Uh, but then, uh, it, when when you have a fill uh, sometimes you, you play the cymbals, but you also have these tom-toms. Now, tom-toms are closer to what this is doing. Tom-toms are the ones that does give you uh, pretty pure tones, and has the bass tone, and then the fundamental frequency, and then the next one would be J02. That will be the next frequency that you hear. And then all these uh, other, other frequencies are being heard at the same time when you hear that tom-tom. So, uh, although these percussive instruments don't really, uh, you don't play them for sounds, right? Uh, like for, for melodies, right? Because you, you don't have a defined melody. The difference between this one and a, a, a string that's tied like that is this one, this one has the fundamental frequency with the standing wave being this one. That, that's the one that's goes the slowest, right? But then the next one is like that one, going like that, right? And then the, the third one is like this one, so it's like like that. And these frequencies are uh, in complete ratio of each other. So uh, this third one will vibrate three times as fast as the fundamental frequency. So the structure of the harmonics that you see when you play guitar is, is very, natural because you have the fundamental frequency, twice the fundamental frequency, three times the fundamental frequency. And uh, anytime you double the frequency, you get one octave higher. So you get, you get if, if you
play a note that's A, then you get a one octave high A. And then the third one would be uh, the next tone of E. And then you come back to another octave higher A, and then you get like something like E flat or something, and then it just keep, keeps building on. And, and those are, those actually have a defined tune if you hear it. Whereas tom toms, because their their frequency structures are not like that, you don't really have that kind of thing. It's like if you listen to the bass note, it sounds like oh, this seems to be tuned at A, you might say. But then the the harmonics over that is not A, so you you, you hear some other things as well. Uh, now, uh, if you go to any concert and hear marimba or xylophone or whatever, those are uh, rectangular, right? So if you have a rectangular wave and, and then if you solve this for, with the uh, with the separation of variables, you see that there's the wave that's, that's doing this that way, but there's also a wave that's like that, right? So uh, if you listen to marimba carefully, then as the notes change as you go up, there's always this defined tone that's equal throughout this all of the melodies because of, of, of this part. There's a very high pitched thing that's like constant through everything. So that's another tonal structure. So like, being able to solve the wave equation gives you some uh, extra insight into how instruments should sound. Yeah. And uh, Next time you talk to a drummer, ask them, oh, do you tune your tom-toms? They'll be like, yeah, I do. How do you know? Yeah. It's, uh, it's all about changing the bass frequency to the actual music that you're playing. Yeah. But you don't tune your snare. Maybe you do just to make it a little higher, but you don't tune it to a special key of the music. But they would be calculating this. Yeah, they, by, they do it by ear, right? They, they, they make it a little higher, lower by changing the tension. See, changing the tension changes the C value. The, the tighter you, you put the skin, then this increases so it, the pitch goes up. Same thing with the string. That's, that's what happens. All right, so that's, that's like the insight that you gain by doing all this hard work, okay? Or by playing drums. I, I don't know which one's easier.